guys, welcome to this review and reading of Choose Your Own Adventure number 83, Track of the Bear by R.A. Montgomery. And uh, we're going to read through this. Uh, this is a blind read through for me. I have not read this before. And I think what we're, we're going to do is uh, it's very likely that I'm not going to choose the best path just on a first attempt. So what we'll do is, uh, if we don't uh, get the ending that we like, then we're going to back up and uh, I will look up the best ending and uh, we can proceed from there and uh, see what would have happened if we'd made all the right choices. And then at the end of this video, uh, I'll do a quick review, uh, give you my thoughts of uh, what I think of the book. and. Uh, at that point, if you like it, you know, let me know. I, I appreciate your comments, and uh, if you, you have uh, some suggestions on what books you'd like me to read in the future, uh, let me know. Uh, now, my, you probably have noticed my voice sounds a little different today. I do have a cold. I'm hoping to make it through. I'm probably setting myself up for trouble here. I'm doing all this reading with a cold, but we're going to go ahead and try it. Because this looks like a great book, and it's been a while since I've uh, done a reading of one of these cho Choose Your Own Adventures. Alright, let's begin by reading the back of the book here. Uh, of course, the title of this book is Track of the Bear. It says, You are the star. 15 exciting endings. Can you survive the Arctic to solve a deadly mystery? Years ago, your great-grandfather, the famous explorer, Red Olson, disappeared during an expi expedition to the Arctic. You've always been convinced that Red discovered a small island there, even though explorer Evan Skagel took all the credit. When a movie about Skagel's discovery is made, you decide to find out the truth. As you follow the trail of clues, you notice one thing. Evan Skagel always turns up where you do. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and begin. You're angry, angrier than you've ever been in your life. Just this morning, you've read in the Toronto Globe and Mail that a movie is being made in Hollywood about the famous Arctic explorer, Evan Arthur Skagel, who supposedly discovered that far northern island of Skagelmere. According to the article, the explorer's great-grandson, Evan Arthur Skagel IV, sold the movie rights for $1 million. What makes you so angry is that your family has always believed that Red Olson, your great-grandfather, discovered that island. But you have no proof to back up your claim. Red Olson was an experienced and successful explorer. He and Skagel left on their expedition from different points on the Arctic Ocean at approximately the same time. Skagel returned victorious. Red Olson and his Eskimo companion vanished without a trace. Over the years, the glory has gone to Skagel's family. Now, there's going to be a movie about Skagel, and it makes you furious. Still angry, you glance at your most prized possession, a faded brown photograph of Red Olson. In the photograph, he's holding a carving of a polar bear whose legs are stretched out in a strange position. The bear looks like it's flying, the Eskimos liked Red, and they gave him that bear, your grandfather once said to you. But it disappeared when he did. Although no one could tell it from the picture, your great-grandfather had flaming red hair, just like you and some of your cousins. Many times your grandfather told you so. You were very close to your grandfather since he raised you after your parents died in a car accident when you were just an infant. But last winter, your grandfather died, too, leaving you with no family closer than your cousins. You know that your grandfather was about your age when Red Olson disappeared. As your grandfather grew old and got sick, seeing you reminded him of his youth, and he thought often of his father. His last words spoken to you from his deathbed were, Find out what happened to him. My bones won't rest until you do. Turn to page 14.
It's summertime and your cousins have gone to Europe for a long vacation. They invited you to go along, but you've got other plans. You're going to attend the annual dinner of the Society of Arctic Explorers in Montreal, Canada. Every year you're invited and every year you refuse because so much attention is paid to successful explorers like Evan Arthur Skegel. But this time you've decided to go anyway. Maybe you'll meet someone who can help you fulfill your grandfather's last wish. Turn to page four. You arrive in Montreal, a charming city of old stone buildings and modern skyscrapers, and check into the Ritz Hotel. Later, you go downstairs to the banquet hall where the dinner is to be held. A woman is checking off the guests' names and handing out name tags. You're a descendant of whom? she asks. Red Olson, the... <laughs> the guy who didn't make it to Skagelmere Island interrupts a loud voice behind you. It's Evan Arthur Skagel IV, a big burly guy with muscular arms and a little mustache. The well-known Arctic explorer, you tell the woman, ignoring Skagel. Oh yes, here's your name. She hands you your tag. See you inside, says Skagel with a wicked grin. Not if I can help it, you think. Turn to page three. You find a seat at the long table in the banquet hall, as far from Evan Arthur Skegel IV as you can get. An arctic delicacy is served as an appetizer, raw, well skin. You gulp it down quickly. Fortunately, the main course is more appetizing. As you eat, you look around the hall. Many prominent and wealthy people have been invited to the dinner in order to raise money for the society. The Eskimos, whose knowledge of the terrain was of great value to those explorers who would listen, are also represented. A group of their descendants is sitting together at one end of the table. An exhibit of Eskimo artifacts and art is on display in an adjoining room. Later, a moving toast is made to your grandfather, who raised a lot of money for the society. But when the attention turns to Evan Arthur Skagel and the forthcoming movie, you decide to go out for some air. The Eskimo people have long been an interest of yours, so you wander into the exhibit in the next room. Spotlighted in a glass case is a beautiful polar bear carved from narwhal tusk. The animal's front legs sweep back along the sides, and the rear legs are stretched out behind so that the bear appears to be flying. It looks very much like the carving that Red Olson is holding in the faded brown photograph you treasure. Turn to page 12. You admire that carving? A voice beside you says. You're startled since you didn't hear anyone approach. Standing next to you is an Eskimo boy about your age with bright eyes and black hair. We are used to moving softly in my country, he says as if in apology. My name is Nitnuk, and I am from Invit, a village in the Arctic where we try to keep the old ways. You nod. The carving is beautiful, you reply. I saw one like it in a photo. My great-grandfather was holding the carving. Excuse me for being impolite, says Nitnuk with a smile. But you have what we call the mark of the midnight sun. They say it happens to people who stay out too long in the summer, at the time of year when the sun is always above the horizon. You understand that he means your red hair, and you smile too. Already you like this good-natured boy. You have redheads in your village? You ask incredulously, looking at his coal-black hair. Only one now. But there have been others, he says. I do not believe that they had too much sun, though. I believe the other story, that an explorer with red hair passed through our village a long time ago and left some children behind, and that some of his descendants have red hair to this day. 
Maybe it was my ancestor, Red Olson, you say. Red Olson was your ancestor? He stayed in my village when my great-grandfather was a boy. I have heard great-grandfather and the other elders speak of Red Olson with much respect. Suddenly the lights go out and the exhibition room is plunged into darkness. What the? Beside you, Nipnuk struggles with something or someone. Hey! He screams. A strong arm pushes against you and you fall to the floor. You hear the sound of glass smashing and then footsteps running out of the room and down the hallway. If you chase after the assailant, turn to page 20. If you stay and look after Nitnook, turn to page 29. Hmm. I think we should stay and look after Nitnook. We'll see if he's okay. Let's turn to page 29. Are you all right? You ask Nitnook. I think so, he replies. In a few minutes, the lights come back on, and you can see a large bruise on Nitnook's forehead, but otherwise, he seems to be okay. Do not worry, he says. The thief probably thinks he got an Ashuna bear, but that bear was not marked. It was not nearly as valuable as an Ashuna. They are irreplaceable. Ashuna bears are used by shamans, you see, the wise men among my people. Ashuna was the name of a very powerful shaman. The shamans carve their signs and records of special events onto the bears and sometimes they leave them in sacred places. A bear that has the mark of a shaman is thought to have a lot of power. Nitnuk pauses, then he continues. I think my great-grandfather could tell you some things about Red Olson that would interest you very much. Would you like to come back to Invit with me? You can't think of anything you'd like more. When do we leave? You reply. Turn to page 27. It's 2,000 miles by plane from Montreal to Nitnook's village. The roads end at a place called Dead Dog. The regularly scheduled flights end at Dead Dog also. But there, you find the Twin Otter Taxi Service that will fly you 400 miles north to the village of Domali on the Arctic Sea, the closest place to Invit that a plane can land. After you leave Dead Dog, you see nothing but tundra, rivers, and an occasional lake. It's a bumpy flight and you're glad to get your feet back on the ground. You're disappointed though at how trashy Domali looks with its metal buildings and its car parts and machines scattered everywhere. Nitnook senses your dismay. Many towns in the Arctic look like this, he says. It's a matter of necessity and convenience. In the winter we live here, but in summer we return to Invit, where we try to keep the old ways and are not dependent on all this machinery. Turn to page 36. You stay in Domali for just one day, long enough to get supplies. Then you begin to trek to Invit. The country is wide open and the land and sky seem to go on forever. At this time of year, in early summer, the sun is always low on the horizon. Even at midnight, there is still light in the southern sky. This part of the country is teeming with wildlife, musk oxen with shaggy coats, Wolves, foxes, birds, brown bears, golden eagles. One night you wake into the sound of a herd of caribou thundering past like an army on the march. There is much wildlife in this part of Canada, Nitnook says. In the old days, we were one with the animals. We were predators, just as they are, but we lived in harmony with them. We needed each other, even now. We kill only what we need, and always we do it with respect. By the way, he adds, smiling, we are only a few miles from the campsite where some of my people will be hunting. 
I think one of them would like to meet you. Turn to page 73. When you reach the campsite, you understand immediately why Nitnook has brought you here. Standing near the campfire is a girl with bright red hair. Her name is Rikfa, Nitnook says. Rikfa is stunned to see you, so startled that at first she has nothing to say. She touches your hair, then touches her own, and her eyes fill with tears. Finally, she is able to talk. I have never seen anyone before with red hair, except an uncle who died when I was little. All my life I have felt so different. You tell her the story of Red Olson, and she's overjoyed to learn that you're probably distantly related. Suddenly, a shortwave radio near the campfire crackles, and a scratchy voice speaks. The words are barely intelligible to you, but Nitnook understands that the voice is saying that the caribou have reached Invit, and he is needed for the hunt. Rikfa turns to you. Could you stay here for a while? she asks. I would like to get to know you. You are tempted, but you also want very much to meet Nitnook's great-grandfather. If you stay with Rikva, turn to page 52. If you give your apologies to Rikva and then go off with Nitnook, turn to page 50. Uh, I think we want to meet Nitnook's great-grandfather. We're going to go with... Let's see. We're going to give our apologies to Rikva and then go off with Nitnook. So we'll turn to page 50. Several days later, you arrive in Nitnook's village, where you meet his sisters and brothers, his parents, his grandparents, and his great-grandfather, Iktat, the elder. Iktat is the oldest and most respected person in the village, a tiny man with a brown wrinkled face and wise old eyes. Even in summer, he wears a sealskin parka, and his face is wrapped in fur. My great-grandfather is a shaman, Nitnook says. In the old days when we lived closely with the animals, it was believed that shamans could change people from human form to animal and back again. The Ashuna bears have given power to many generations of shamans, and that is why the Ashuna is so important to us. Of all the animals, he continues, we admire polar bears the most because they are the best hunters in the Arctic. They are very strong and very smart. The ancients believed polar bears had great powers, that they could even fly and walk on the bottom of the ocean. Do you think shamans still have special powers? You ask. You will see. Turn to page 44. Nitnook, his father, and his brothers go off hunting for a week, but you stay behind and feel right at home in Invit. The people are friendly and kind. You decide that you especially like the dogs, huskies with thick shaggy coats, curled tails, and masks around their eyes. They are working dogs, Nitnook tells you when he returns. You must treat them with respect and never baby or spoil them. The dog you like best is Eo, a lead dog bigger than all the others and very much in command. He has led the team to three victories in the Trans-Arctic Dog Race, Nitnook says. He is retired from the competition now, but he still loves to run. Turn to page 110. The time passes slowly. You're beginning to think your search for Red Olson's story is getting nowhere, and you should just go home. But one summer night after he has returned from hunting, Nindnook tells you that Iktak, the elder, wants to speak with you. You've been waiting over three weeks to hear this. Turn to page 42.
Although it's late, the sun hovers in the southern sky. You walk to the river where Iktat waits, sitting cross-legged on a rock. He doesn't speak English, so Nitnuk translates. At first, Iktat the Elder doesn't say anything, though. He stares off into the distance, his eyes narrow to slits. Finally, he begins. I remember your ancestor, Red Olsen, even though I was only a boy when he passed through the village. He was a friend of my grandfather and of the people. I can help you on your quest to learn of his fate. Red Olsen went to the island they now call Skegelmere, and he went with Otvik, one of my people. He did, you say with a gasp. Yes, he was the first white man to reach Skagelmere Island. My grandfather told me that, but Red Olsen did not come back. His bones are still there, along with something else. Something my grandfather gave him to help him on his journey. If you want, I will search the island for you. You can barely contain your excitement. You bet I do, and I'll go with you, you say. The old man does not respond, but Nitnuk smiles at you. Wait, he says, and see. Turn to page 58. Iktat the Elder removes something from his parka, an Ashuna bear carved with his sign and polished by many years of use. Fly like a bird, O oh spirit. Be strong and cunning like the polar bear. He chants, holding the carving in his hands as he goes into a deep trance. Nitnuk explains what the shaman is doing. His body stays beside you, but his spirit leaves. Searching Skagelmere Island for some sign of Red Olsen. You sit and wait, awed by the power of the old man. Ah! says, suddenly opening his eyes and blinking, as if startled to find himself back with you. Red Olsen left a cairn on the cliff above Muslip's fjord. It is two thousand and fifty steps north of the lips. You will find what you are looking for there. Thank you, you say. Thank you very much. Iktat waves his hand as if to say it was nothing. Fred Olsen was a good friend to my people. Turn to page 40. You want to set off immediately for Skagomir Island. It would be better to wait several weeks until the channel freezes again, Nitnook tells you because then we can travel across the ice by dog sled the way Red Olsen did. If you go now, you will have to go by plane. There is not enough ice to cross on foot, but there is enough to make a crossing by boat dangerous. I suggest you wait. You'd like to stay in this village for a while, but you're eager to find out more about Red and to search for the Karen. If you decide to wait, turn to page 59. If you choose to hire a plane and go now, turn to page 82. Now we are going to listen to our wise friend and wait. We're going to turn to page 59. You spend the next few weeks in Inuit learning the Eskimo way of listening to Iktat, the elder's stories about Red Olsen. According to Iktat, when your great-grandfather sailed his ship into the bay where Domali is now, the Eskimos had never seen a white man or a large ship, so they paddled out to it in their umiaks in amazement. 
Red Olsen had brought some musicians along to make the trip more pleasant for his crew. When he saw the Eskimos coming, he told the musicians to play and the crew to dance. That was the Eskimos' first sight of white men dancing in uniforms on the deck of a ship. The next morning, the Eskimos brought out a drum and danced on the shore for Red and his crew. It was the beginning of a rare friendship. When Red left his ship to explore the land north of Domali, he went by dog team. Utvik went with him. The first Evan Arthur Skagel left at approximately the same time from a point farther east. All these stories have made you even more eager to follow your great-grandfather's path. You can hardly wait to begin your trek to the island. Turn to page 67. You and Nitnook plan to cross the ice with two dog teams. Nitnook will be breaking in some new dogs, so he suggests that you train with Eo's team, as they are the most experienced. You learn how to harness the dogs and how to command them to start, to stop, to go slowly, and to go fast. Hako, 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 you call to turn left, and Achu, 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 to turn right. The dogs are very strong, but obedient. Their plumed tails wave in front of you as they race across the snow. Eo can almost read your mind. You think a command, and almost before you call it, he responds. Nitnook is pleased with your progress. The dogs are responding very well, he says. They follow the lead dog, and if the lead dog respects and likes you, you are set. He smiles. Eo likes you. Turn to page 77. Finally, the people of Invet move back to Domali. The channel to Skagelmere is frozen over, and you're ready to go. The women of Invic make you a sealskin parka and boots. The clothing is softer and warmer than any you've ever worn, which is good because already it's very cold. When you step outside, your face hurts and your teeth ache. The nights are long now, but the stars are bright, the moon lights the snow, and you can see well enough to travel even at night. Just before you plan to leave Domali, you're walking down the main street when you notice someone familiar ahead of you. Even in his heavy winter snowmobile suit, the man looks suspiciously like Evan Arthur Skiggle the Fourth. Cautiously, you walk down the street until you get some distance ahead of the man. Then you glance back quickly. It's Skagel, all right. He must have traced you to Domali. If you decide to confront Skagel and find out what he's doing in Domali, turn to page 69. If you get out of town quickly before he sees you, turn to page 37. I think we're going to try to avoid this guy. Let's get out of town quick before he sees us and turn to page 37. You dart into an alley and hurry back to tell Nitnook you want to start for Skagelmere immediately. It doesn't take long to say goodbye to the people of Invit and move out with the dogs. Soon you and Nitnook are flying over the ice and snow that shimmer with moonlight. Even when Nitnook is way ahead of you, you can see him clearly on the ice. You can also hear his voice as he calls out commands to his dog team. Sounds travel a great distance in the stillness of the Arctic. When you have been traveling for several hours, Nitnook stops and cocks his head toward Domali. Do you hear something? he asks. You listen carefully. In the distance, you hear a faint droning. It's the first time you've noticed the sound, but Nitnook says he's begun to hear it soon after you left Domali. Maybe it's someone out hunting, you suggest. Maybe, Nitnook replies. Turn to page 80. The channel is frozen solid, 
The moon is bright and you proceed easily towards Skegelmere Island. However, the droning sound continues behind you and it bothers Nitnook. There is no reason anyone would come way out here to hunt, he says. That depends on what you're hunting for, you reply. The sound continues, sometimes closer, sometimes farther away, but always there, even as you circle Skegelmere Island looking for Mooslip's Fjord. There it is, Nitnook cries after much looking. See the way the lip comes out there? He points towards the cliff above the frozen fjord. You laugh because the cliff looks just like another snow-covered hill to you. But Nitnook is sure this is the right cliff, although he thinks this spot is too steep to climb and wants to look for another place. You hesitate. You've climbed some mountains before and this one doesn't look so bad. If you choose to climb here, turn to page 98. If you follow Nitnook's advice and look for another spot, turn to page 70. I think we're going to follow Nitnook's advice. He, uh, he can read the snow and mountains much better than we can. Let's turn to page 70. You and Nitnook travel along the coast of the island until you find a more gentle incline and climb it carefully. When you reach the top, you make your way back towards Muslip Fjord. You notice that you don't hear the droning sound anymore. Maybe whoever it was turned back, Nidnook says. I hope so, you reply. From above, it's not easy to locate the lip shape that was near to Nidnook from below. Finally, you agree on a place to start. Turn to page 78. You turn north and begin to count off the 250 steps that Iktat mentioned. One, two, three, four. But there's no need to count very far because ahead you see a mound of snow. It must be the stone cairn. You race toward it, clearing off the snow and knock the stones loose. Inside you find an Ashuna bear and under it is a leather bound journal filled with entries in a handwriting that you recognize as Red Olson's. Why did my great-grandfather and Otvik leave the bear here? You ask Nitnuk. Otvik was thanking the spirits for bringing them to the island. My people like to leave an offering and perhaps a message when we go to a new place. He turns the bear over in his hands. Look! Carved into the side of the bear, are the latitude and longitude of this spot, the date, and Red Olson and Utvik's initials. Wow, you say. This proves my great-grandfather was here and that he discovered this island first. The date is three days before Skagel claimed he got here. Turn to page 41. The Karen has kept the journal dry, and the writing is faded, but still legible. You begin to read. After the expedition left the ship, it ran into difficulties. The men were held up by a blizzard. Food supplies became low. Some of them suffered from frostbite and exposure. Finally, Red Olsen sent everyone but Otvik back to the ship. He and Otvik made good time, and before long, they reached the island. The last few entries are optimistic. Otvik has killed a seal for food. The weather looks good. They are heading back, traveling south-southwest. The very last entry in the journal reads, This being a true record of our journey, I leave it here as evidence that Otvik and I reached this point. The account is dated and signed by Red Olson. But what happened to Red and Otvik, you wonder? Are there bodies here somewhere? If you decide to look for Red and Odvik's bodies, turn to page 86. If you think you should get the evidence of Red's discovery back to Damali right away, turn to page 96. Uh, I think since we're so far away, like we're already right here, we should probably look around and see if we can see Red and Odvik's bodies. 
Uh, so let's turn to page 86. Oh, wow. Look at this amazing drawing of a polar bear with cubs. That's pretty amazing. All right, let's turn to the next page. You walk in a south southwesterly direction following Red's route, wanting to know what went wrong, why he and Odvik never made it back to Damali. Finally, you reach an opening between the high cliffs that leads to the channel ice. You look up at the cliffs and see indentations that appear to be caves. I'd like to take a look in a few of those caves before we leave, you say to Nitnuk. It's midday, and you still have a few more hours before darkness falls. Leaving the dogs and sleds on the ice, you and Nitno climb up to the caves. The first two you enter are empty except for bird droppings and the bones of some animals. Just one more, you tell the ever-patient Nitnook. I am in no hurry, he says. As you enter the third cave, you shut your eyes for a moment to adjust to the dark. When you open them again, you see large white skeletons lying on the floor, the bones of two men, one much taller than the other. Red Olson was a very tall man. Turn to page 109. I'll bet it's what's left of Red and Otvik, you say, moving closer to examine the bones. And you become sure of it when you find some strands of red hair preserved by the cold Arctic air. You're wondering what the two men died of in the shelter spot when you notice something protruding from the ribcage of the taller skeleton. You turn the skeleton over and pull out a knife. Red was murdered and in the most cowardly way possible, he was stabbed in the back. You examine the other skeleton and find a knife in its back also. The two men were probably stabbed in their sleep. Nitnook is examining the floor of the cave and picks up something. Polar bear droppings, he says. Suddenly a shadow falls across the cave opening. You turn and see the shape of a large man in a snowmobile suit. It's Evan Arthur Skagel the fourth. Turn to page 87. Well, well, says Skagel, what have we here? Two nosy intruders and a bunch of bones. What we have here is proof that Red Olson discovered this island first and evidence that Evan Arthur Skagel, your ancestor, killed him, you reply. Very interesting, says Skagel. If that's true, which I doubt, but if it's true, it would interfere with my plans. I couldn't let you get in the way of my ancestor's reputation and a million dollar movie deal, now could I? Why don't you just give me the evidence you have and forget all about what you found here? No way, you say. Skagel reaches into a pocket, pulls out a gun, and forces you to give him the journal. I've got the perfect use for this little document, he says. It'll make great kindling for my fire. Give that back to me, you cry. Nitnook, standing in the back of the cave with the Ashuna bear in his hands, doesn't say a word. Turn to page 68. Let me see that, Skagel says, pointing his gun at the bear. Nitnook hands it to him, smiling strangely. Skagel turns the carving over in his hands, looking at the inscription and the date. My ancestors knew you Eskies would leave something like this around, but we were never able to find it until you two came along. I know a family that's going to be very happy to get their hands on this bear. Nitnook mumbles something. It sounds like, and I know a bear who would be very happy to get his paw on you. But that makes no sense. You think you must be losing your grip on things. Well, it's time to say your prayers, Skagel says. Now why don't you two just lie down there on the floor of the cave? 
A couple of months and you'll be a pile of bones too. Skegel points the gun at you and Nitnook. You lie down next to the skeletons. This is it, you think, wondering if you'll feel any pain or hear the sound of the gun. Suddenly, a deafening roar fills the cave. Turn to page 88. What the? Skegel starts to say as a large, angry polar bear lumbers out of the shadows. It must have been aroused from a deep slumber, you think, and it's not happy about it. You see a flash of white fangs and fur. The bear swats Evan Arthur Skegel IV with a heavy paw. Ah! screams Skegel, dropping the Ashuna bear. The polar bear swats again, knocking Skegel from the mouth of the cave and down the cliff. You hear another scream, and then nothing. The bear lumbers past you back into the depths of the cave. It has all happened so fast that you can't believe you even saw it. But Nitnook acts as if polar bears saved his life every day. The Ashuna bear brings power to those who treat it with respect, he says, but the power works against those who do not. He picks the bear carving up from the floor and puts it in his parka. Turn to page 93. When you, Nitnook, and the artifacts are safely back in Domali, Nitnook offers you the Ashuna bear. You are grateful and don't want to offend him by refusing a gift, but you think the bear belongs with his people. Keep it for me here where it's safe. I'll be back to visit it and to go on the ice with you again, you tell Nitnook. You too, you add, patting Io on the head. Turn to page 71. You present Red Olson's journal to the Canadian government. They are astounded at your discovery and agree that the name of the island should be changed immediately from Skegelmir to Olsen. Your great-grandfather finally gets the honor he deserves. And at the next annual meeting of the Society of Arctic Explorers, the toasts are made to him and to you. The end. Wow, okay, well, I, I think we got the best ending. I mean, really, what's better than that? Uh, we've cleared our grandfather's name. We obtained a cool, rare artifact that the villagers are going to hold for us. We've met a new friend, our dog, Io. And uh, we proved that our grandfather was the first discoverer and disproved the other family, the Skagelmere guys. So I think I think we got the best uh, ending, and I'm not gonna bother looking it up. I imagine that's the best one. <laughs> um. Anyway, that's uh, that was cool. I, I like this book. Um, the book is beat to heck for sure, um, but it's still I think it's a little bit of a treasure. Um, I like this. Um, as far as a book review goes, I, I think this was a fun one. Now, I wasn't real happy. Like, it seemed like we got the obvious ending. Like, I don't think it was that hard to get the the best ending. Um, and it seemed... So maybe we're kind of like on train rails for... You know, with just a little bit of hints of options from t picking different choices. But it seems like this was clearly like the, the route we were supposed to take. Um, it'd be interesting if they had other uh, endings. I haven't read this before, so I don't know if there are other cool endings like this one. But, um, it'd be interesting if they made different kinds of endings that were fun. I think it said on the back here, there are 15 exciting endings. So maybe, maybe there's some good endings there. I think they were very respectful to the Eskimo people. Although I think the word Eskimo might actually, uh, these days, I think it might actually be offensive. I believe Eskimos, like uh, Inuit, I believe is the politically correct term. 
So I think this book was written um, before it was really uh, known that using the term Eskimo might be offensive. Um, but otherwise, they were very respectful. Um, I like the incorporation. Like, I, I liked when we uh, ran into the grandfather and he, like, did the uh, out of body experience kind of thing. That was kind of cool how he did that. Um, I guess we did have another ancestor we bumped into, that girl. I don't have don't know really what happened with her um, it'd be interesting if he goes back and finds out um, of course these days we could do a DNA test but I think this book was written before that was really a possibility but uh, we could go back and do a DNA test and find out all the people we're related to um, but this is cool it kind of had a young Indiana Jones sort of feel to it um, with you know adventures along the way and animals and wildlife so uh, I would give this, uh, let's see, as far as a rating scale, how should we rate these Choose Your Own Adventures? <laughs> I think I would give this five out of five hot air balloons. So on a rating scale of uh, one to five hot air balloons, this was a five hot air balloon as far as adventure. We did lots of traveling to remote areas and there was some, uh, there were some artifacts involved and treasure and some lore and some I don't know it's all pretty cool so five out of five hot air balloons for track of the bear by R.A. Montgomery this has been Sprocket reading through another choose your own adventure with kind of a raspy voice I'm sorry about that in the next video I hope to have a little bit uh, more recovered and uh, let me know if you have a choice of what you'd prefer us to read otherwise I'll just Pick at random one of the uh, books that looks good to me. And uh, I hope you'll come along on another adventure. So, thanks for coming along. Leave me a comment. Leave me a thumbs up if you like this. If you want to see more content like this. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I'll catch you in the next video. Take care.